Hey there, fight fans. Welcome to the UFC on ESPN Plus 13. Jermaine Durandamy versus Aspen Ladd post-fight show brought to you by SB Nation MMA, which includes MMAmania.com and also BloodyElbow.com, the only two websites on the entire World Wide Web you'll ever need to go if you're trying to figure out what's happening in mixed martial arts. What just happened on this main card portion of UFC Fight Night 155 in Sacramento, California, was a women's bantamweight number one contender fight, in my opinion, between Jermaine Durandamy and Aspen Ladd. Jermaine Durandamy threw a couple of jabs out there that landed on Aspen Ladd. She moved to her left. She fainted the jab out there and then crushed the jaw right across the jaw of Aspen Ladd. In 16 seconds, she got the TKO finish. There's going to be a lot of controversy for the stoppage. Jermaine Randomy landed that right straight that sent Aspen Ladd face down to the canvas and then attempted to throw a left hook, a ground and pound strike on Aspen Ladd to kind of close the deal. But as she was throwing that left hand, Herb Dean came in, grabbed her arm, and it did not connect with the head of Aspen Ladd. Aspen Ladd seemed to have her wits about her quite a bit as she uh, rolled to her, her butt and tried to... Uh, she was going to try to defend some ground and pound strikes from Jermaine Duranamy. Herb Dean waved it off. The, she seemed to have her wits about her. But nonetheless, as uh, Andrew Lawrence via the Middle Easy MMA Twitter says, hey, that stop, he said, I'm going to read the tweet from Middle Easy. That stoppage sucked, but also don't get straight dropped by a clean right on the chin. That's a bad thing to do in a fight. The referee might stop it. I think the stoppage... Um, I know it's going to be controversial. I was fine with it. Jermaine did drop Aspen Ladd like a sack of potatoes, but 8 Levity 6 thinks it was an early stoppage. There, Man, there's such a fine line, and Herb Dean gets a lot of flack for this type of thing. Um, you, there, it would have been nice to see some solidifying ground and pound strikes from Jermaine Duranamy, or let her get back to her feet and then get dropped again. Maybe then you stop it. You know, you want some definitive thing to happen there. But at the same time, you got to think that we need to protect fighter safety. But Priam Alemian says it was an early stoppage. He says Lad can handle herself on the ground. And Kyle Mongari said, let her get fully clean knocked out. In the post-fight interview, um, Michael Bisbing did not follow Joe Rogan's rule of not interviewing fighters who have been just knocked out. But Michael Bisbing talked to Aspen Ladd, and Aspen Ladd said, um, you know, that's a tough spot for the referee. He did what he thought was right, but I know that I had my, I, I, felt, I felt fine. I felt like I had my wits about me. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Michael V was an early stoppage, but she should have got she would have gotten stopped eventually. So now that we talked about what happened, how it happened, I got a comment last week from one of my friends on Twitter who said that I need to I need to say what happened, how it happened before I talk about what's next for each individual fighter. There's not a lot to cover here. It is tied for the fastest finish in UFC or the fastest TKO finish in UFC women's bantamweight history at 16 seconds, tied with Ronda Rousey's TKO or KO victory over Alexis Davis uh, quite a long time ago. But there's not a lot to be said. I mean, there was a couple of fainting jabs from Aspen Ladd. The official stats had Aspen Ladd landing zero of four strikes and Jermaine Durandamy landing four of five total strikes. Not a lot to say there. It started out, they came out, they touched gloves. Jermaine landed a few... I think it was two jabs, but I think maybe the stats want me to think it was three jabs. And then she pumped, fainted the jab out there, and the right hand just crushed her. Not a lot to really mention. Kyle Mangari says that we need to see a rematch. Uh, for IMU says, hey, her misty woodpile ref Dean has done it again. One thing to make a statement, but another thing to screw with people's careers. Not Daniel says, so many quick KOs this month, man. DC says, better a late stoppage, and she would have gotten the win soon anyway. Aspen Ladd, baby leg, says Jordy L. 
Robert Brunting or Bunting says, did Lad lose? Yes, in 16 seconds via TKO. And Rob Amon says that Herb Dean has regressed as a referee. But now, let's talk about what's next for these fighters. I think what's next for Jermaine Duran to me is a title shot against Amanda the Lioness Nunes. Regardless of if this stoppage against Aspen Ladd was, was fast and maybe a little bit unjust, a, a little bit premature, I think that we know that Jermaine Duranamy has really good striking skills, and she showed this, she's got some pretty darn solid pop here. I think she's going to get a title shot against Amanda the Lioness Nunes. Nunes does not have any clear-cut contenders right now. Um, she does already own a victory over Jermaine Duranamy, but coming into this fight, I thought if... Durand me got a victory no matter how she got it. I would want to see her fight Amanda Nunes for the belt. I, I would speculate I wouldn't want it in the main event, perhaps, but I do. that's the fight I want to see next. I think it could be a compelling fight. I'd like to see it as the co-main event to maybe John Jones' next title fight, and we just keep Amanda Nunes as the co-main event to Johnny Bones Jones. Durand me in the post-fight interview with, Dan, with uh, Michael Bisping, he asked her, What's next? And she's like, I don't know. We'll see what the UFC says. It would have been more convincing for her to get a title shot if she would have said something solid on the microphone. But I don't think that's that's what Jermaine Duran to me, not the type of person she is. She's a full-time police officer in her hometown in Denmark or the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. And uh, she seems pretty humble. But people like me are going to say it for her. She needs a title shot against... Amanda Nunes. Jack Attack says, Mike Bisbing is a legend for telling the crowd to give Jermaine her her due credit and that it wasn't her that stopped the fight. Oh, very good point, Jack. And also, Jermaine said, hey, Sacramento, I get it. I understand. It's fine if you boo. You know. Uh, and then she also, Bisbing also asked her what she thought of the stoppage. And she's like, hey, man, that's not my job. My job was to hit her with that right hand and crush her. And also, she said, if you look right here, Aspen doesn't look like she knows where she's at. So, I think it's good. Sandman, 62-100. I'm glad they stopped it. What's next for Aspen Ladd? Let's talk about her for just a brief moment at least. So she was undefeated coming into this fight. She was a slight favorite to Jermaine Duran to me. Um, and she looked terrible on the scale yesterday. And there was a lot of speculation that, that because she looked terrible on the scale, she was going to look terrible in this fight tonight. But, I mean, she came into the fight undefeated, having looked bad on the scale her last few times out. I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure she looked bad on the scale against Tanya Evinger and then beat Evinger TKO in round number one, th three minutes and 26 seconds, got a performance of the night. Next time out, got fight of the night um, and a decision over Sajar Eubanks, her second win over Eubanks. So she's been looking terrible on the scale for a while, but Rob Amon in the comments says... Perhaps we could see Aspen Ladd go up to 145 pounds and fight somebody like Megan Anderson. That's a fine idea as well. Um, I would give her another shot to, to look a little better on the scale at 135 pounds. I think that she's definitely a future contender. Tonight was a small setback. Similar to what Ben Askren getting flying knee knocked out in five seconds. That doesn't tell us a lot about him. We didn't learn much from that fight other than like we knew Ben Askren was going to run out there and go for that takedown. Did this tell us a lot about Aspen Ladd? Not really. It might have showed us, it might have just brought to light that she, uh, she's not that durable because of the weight cut. But, I mean, getting caught on the jaw like that could, could knock at anybody. Uh, and also, Ladd has missed weight in the past. She, she weighed 100, in at 138 pounds. Um for Invicta FC 18, where Alexa Grasso headlined against Jody Escabel. I think we give her at least another shot to make 135 pounds, maybe look a little better. Neil says, no reason not to make Jermaine Duranamy versus Nunes from a competitive standpoint. GDR never lost the belt in the cage, and Nunes is her only UFC loss, but Cyborg is probably the money fight. Speaking of that, I think that the, the money for Cyborg is what's holding that fight back from happening. But good point, Neil. Steve, Herb Dean has now established a pattern as an early stopper. I don't know the specific details, but he was criticized some time ago for not stepping in quickly enough to protect an unconscious fighter. 
and then I'm going to just kind of elaborate for Steve, even though Steve's not saying this part. And so since then, he's maybe overcompensated and been stopping these fights a little bit early, perhaps. Jack attacks. She looks so bad on the scale, but I think it was just a classic case of being considerably outmatched in the striking department. Uh, Drandomy has knocked out men for F's sake. DC Herb being used to stop fights way too late. Rob Amon. Rob's butcher block includes Darren Elkins and Nico Montano. Let's go down and talk about the co-main event of the evening. We'll get to Rob's butcher block after a bit. Let's talk about the co-main event. We'll get into our WTF of the card. And then we'll talk about the rest of it. So the co-main event. Uriah Faber goes out there and and has um, a pretty competitive 46-second fight against Ricky Simone. Ricky Simone hurt and dropped Uriah Faber. I think he dropped him. I'm pretty sure. Let's look at the stats. Takedowns, do we not show knockdowns? Okay, Faber only had the one knockdown, but Ricky Simone uh, put Uriah Faber on wobbly legs very early on with a lead left hook. Solid, solid punch. Ricky Simone landed on Uriah Faber, and it felt at that moment that Ricky Simone was just going to pour it on and get an early stoppage over the elder statesman in the 40 year old Uriah Faber, but no, no dice. As Ricky Simone's moving forward, Uriah Faber shifts his shoulders to the left and uncorks that classic team alpha male overhand right hits ricky simone right on the temple drops him uh and hit him with some ground and pound strikes after that simone seemed to kind of have his wits about him but again you can't get dropped that solidly and expect the referee to not be coming in and doing something about it uriah faber then after knocking getting the tko win over uh the 14 year younger fighter than he Went on the microphone and said, hey, recently Henry Cejudo called me out. I'd like that fight. Dana White called me old, and he said, I know Dana White was old and he was 28, but I'm 40 and I'm still a young man. After a pretty, not a real lengthy retirement, but, but quite a while, Uriah Faber comes back into the UFC, gets a first-round TKO stoppage win over a surging, uh, hungry contender in Ricky Simone. And I don't think he's ever going to get a title shot again, but... I thought, I, I thought that Uriah Faber was going to get murked, and he looked really good. So I'm excited to see his next fight. Orange Justice, the dance. One, I'd love to, this is what they say. I'd love to see Uriah Faber get a title after coming back from retirement. Jack Attack says, Triple C versus the OG, let's go. Rob says that uh, Faber should fight Rob Font next. Kyle Mongari says he, that he loves Faber, but he can't get a title shot after that win. Ricky Simone was number 15 coming into this fight. Uriah Faber obviously unranked coming back from retirement. And I would like to see, what I would like is for Uriah Faber to fight somebody like Rob Font would be fine, or John the Magician Dodson. So he's never fought John Dodson. Both guys have been around for a long time. Um Dang it, Siri, shut up. Shut up. So I, I think I would like to see him fight John Dodson. I mean, Dodson's not the most exciting fighter in the world, but I think that one would make sense. Perhaps Tom Tomas Almeida, that'd be kind of cool as well. But a lot of options for Uriah Faber at this point. Platinum Goat Mike the White Tyson Perry says, uh, Hob Fonch, Rob Font. Bayerman 10, Faber could go for couture status as a 40-plus-year-old champion. That's – it feels like way out of out of the cards, but, I mean, possibly. Steve, Faber was nice. He did get clipped on the chin and maybe even stunned for a millisecond, but Simone couldn't capitalize. Big stage, bright lights. Ivan Pechugin says – Faber versus the Triple C is a nice fight in the future. It'll draw, but Faber needs a top 10 fighter these days. Andrew Duncan says, did Faber win? He did win. A first round TKO victory, 46 seconds over Ricky Simone. Let's get into our WTF of the card. If we can, if you'd like, what was your, what the French toast moment of this card?
Foley Mo says, hey, Four Eyes, nobody cares about you. We just want to see actual fights. My, my mom cares about me. I hope. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but yeah, let's go over our WTF of the card. My co-hosts, you guys, Steve, Bayer, Platinum, Rob, Jack, Kyle. What is your what the F moment of this entire night of fights? Jack Attack says the WTF of the card was the contrast of Montano's body language going back to her corner in the rounds one and then round two. Uh, Bayerman or Bayer says the WTF of the moment was honestly just that early stoppage. So strange and hasty. I'm going to use my WTF of the card to talk about Ryan Hall versus Darren Elkins. What's up, Jason Erickson? So, it was um, kind of midway through the prelim portion. Ryan Hall defeated Darren Elkins, the unanimous decision, 29-28, 29-28, 30-27. And it, it's just a, a what-the-heck moment where Uriah Hall, or not Uriah Hall, Ryan Hall, spinning heel kick. I think, I'm pretty sure it dropped Darren Elkins in the first round, or at least hurt him. Let's look at the stats. Knockdowns, Let's see knockdowns. Yeah, two knockdowns for Ryan Hall. One was in the first round with the spinning heel to the face. And uh, then in the second round, so like Ryan Hall's known for these weird kicks. He got a victory over Gray Maynard by just like being at a distance and kicking him like kind of goofily from range, avoiding the, gra the takedowns from Gray Maynard, avoiding the power of Gray Maynard, and kicking him at range. So we knew that he had these kicks in his arsenal. A lot of pictures of Ryan Hall have him doing these spinning wheel kicks or heels to the face. But he dropped Darren Elkins in the first round. Maybe that wasn't that surprising. But in the second round, twice, Ryan Hall fired off a left straight that hurt Darren Elkins. The second of which dropped Darren Elkins. And it's just like, what the heck or what the F? Ryan Hall just dropped Darren Elkins with punches? And what, and what compounds the what the F of that was before that happened... Michael Bisping was saying that Ryan Hall doesn't have good hands. He's like he's got good kicks. He's got great grappling. Obviously, he's a jujitsu wizard. His nickname's the Wizard, but he doesn't have good boxing. And then he then immediately after that, bam, drops him with a left straight. Glorious. And also, what the f? Ryan Hall got hands. Crazy. Ivan Pichugin says Ryan Hall has one of the weirdest. Is, is one of the weirdest fighters in the UFC, Zahabi and Florian, doing a great job with him. His style is strange. It's very unorthodox. It's fun to watch at times, and other times it's very, like, head-scratching. Like, what? What is he doing? But it, intriguing nonetheless. He's a, a strange, his style is very strange in mixed martial arts, and I think that it adds to the, the nature of uh, mixing martial arts. Neil says, outside of the early stoppage, it was the Van buren Souza fight. Souza seemed like she was flopping for the ref to draw fouls. I noticed it two or three times. Never worked, though. Yeah, we could say WTF the card for uh, Livia Henato Souza. Let's, talk, let's use that to talk about that fight. It was uh, the second fight of the evening. Brianna Van Buren is the shortest fighter on the UFC's roster at five foot nothing. But she was walking Souza down. And landing with a, with quite a bit of power. She would, so she'd move forward on Hinato Souza. Once Souza would like touch her back or touch her foot to the cage, Van Buren was was firing off with a lot of power, hooks in tight, you know, um, kind of kind of corralling Souza and like she'd throw a wide right as Souza would try to circle out from the fence to her left, so toward that power shot of Van Buren. Also, Van Buren was was taking. Uh, advice in the corner very very well I think it was between rounds one and two when Van Buren's corner was saying hey uh, we need more body shots let's go to the liver and she said body shots go to the liver I don't know if that's what she said I can't remember exactly what she said but she was like parod parodying what her corner said and then like went out there and did exactly what her corner said to do I really look forward to her next fight in the UFC 
Ivan Pichugan says Van Buren is very interesting. She's a short dynamite. Like her a lot. I believe she's DC's protege, isn't she? Steve's WTF of the moment was the Herb Dean early stoppage. I had a hunch that Duran and me would take it, but we won't really know how it would have gone. Hashtag tainted. Uh, Bearman Van Buren really strikes me as a star in the making. Entertaining fight and great and likable right away on the mic. Would love to see her get a ranked opponent like she asked for. I believe she asked for a... Was it her who asked for a top 10? And she said, hey, I know it might sound crazy, but I want a top 10 opponent next. I say we give it to her. She showed me enough in this fight that uh, I would like to just move her right up the rankings. Ivan says that she just needs a ground game experience. Anyway, great performance by Brianna Van Buren. I was thoroughly surprised by how much power she had, and I really like, um, I don't know, I like the narrative that she's the shortest fighter in the UFC and then packed quite a wall up for the women's strawweight division. Fun all around. A DC Warrior 886, my what the F moment was Faber winning, but in a good way. Glad I put a little money on him. Yeah, that was a what the f moment. The when Uriah Faber landed the overhand right and dropped Ricky Simone, I was like, "Oh my goodness, what the f!" Very surprising, and great comeback by the forty-year-old Uriah Faber. It, yeah, that was a what the f, wasn't it? Just all of a sudden, did not see it coming. Like I went into the fight fully expecting Ricky Simone to dominate, and when he landed the lead hook to, to wobble Faber at first, I was like, "Okay, yep, I was right. I was very right in my assessment." And then, nope. Over. Dante Gray is uh, talking about the next fight that we need to cover. Josh Emmett, who I believe needs a nickname, TKO'd Mursad Bektic at 425 of round number one. So 35 seconds left to go in the very first round. This fight was interesting. Uh, both guys were landing jabs quite a bit. And it was the jab from Josh Emmett that basically closed the show on Mursad Bektic. Uh, so Emmett, you know, like you don't cross your feet over. You don't like walk towards somebody, but he's using his shuffle step to come to close the distance on Mursad. He, so he, he shuffled two times forward quickly and then threw the jab out there, popped the jab, dropped Mursad Bektic. Coming into the fight, I thought that Josh Emmett would win with an overhand right, like Faber beat Simone with, but like Josh Emmett won his last fight against Michael Demanis Johnson with. Just he, he throws that thing Fast, really, 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 really fast, with a lot of power too, as he's shown in his knockouts of Ricardo Lamas, um, as he, he dropped Jeremy Stevens before getting knocked out himself, and um, over Michael Johnson. But that that stinging jab to drop Mursad Bektic was pretty beautiful, and then follow up ground and pound shots. Uh, there was a couple to the back of the head, but it was an uppercut beat behind the right armpit, like under the right armpit of Mursad Bektic when Bektic was like in the referee's position, snapped his head up and then like fell to the ground more. A couple of um, hammer fists and then like hooking shots for the ground and pound made it call to stop the contest. I believe it was Jason Herzog, the referee, but huge performance by Josh Emmett here. Uh, really halting any hype that was left on the sale of Mursad Bektic. Bektic was one time um, called the the next GSP or the GSP of the featherweight division. He came into his fight against Darren Elkins as a heavy favorite, was styling on Darren Elkins before getting knocked out with a head kick at 319 of round number three in March of 2017. I thought he might be done after that. Uh, but then he came back and he, he just crushed Gato Fredo Pepe, then got a split decision win over Ricardo Lamas, now losing to Josh Emmett. I think he's probably reached his ceiling. You know, he's a fringe top 15 kind of fighter and might be at that level of uh, ranking for quite some time to come. But what's next, do you guys think, for Josh Emmett? Ivan Pachugan says Josh Emmett has crazy power. He's a good short version of Jeremy Stevens. Ooh, Bayerman says Emmett versus the Korean Zombie up next. 
Oh, that'd be delicious. Let's look at the rankings here. So, of course, Max Holloway, our champion, will defend his belt in two weeks over Frankie Edgar. But after him, you've got Alexander Volkanovsky, uh, Brian Ortega, Jose Scarface Aldo, Zabit Magomed Sharipov, uh, Chan Sung Jung, the Korean Zombie, Yair El Pantera Rodriguez, Jeremy Stevens, Hanato Moicano, Josh Emmett. So, Josh Emmett. Uh, just knocked out Mursad Bektic, who was two below him. Maybe we see a fight with him and Hinato Moicano, who just got overhand righted and knocked out by the Korean Zombie. I would also like to see Josh Emmett versus uh, El Pantera. Yair Rodriguez. Is he booked? Let me see. Whoops. I don't think he's booked. DC Warriors says Zabit versus Ortega, Zombie versus Emmett, Aldo versus Rodriguez. All, I mean, let's not kid ourselves, right? Anytime that Josh Emmett's going to be in the octagon, from, from now till the end of time, we're going to tune in. Doesn't matter his opponent. Made 2K says he's on the Mexico card in September. Not officially yet, at least sure dog topology. None of it says that Yair's booked. So that's an option. Also, why not Josh Emmett versus Jose Aldo? Anything of that. DC Warriors, I beat, got, needs a big win next for the title. So maybe Jose Jr. Scarface Aldo. All the options are pretty good. Bayerman says Emmett versus Zombie strikes me as the best matchup. Zombie was barely scratched in his last fight, and he spaces out fights a good bit. Emmett is also in good shape. Good time to book it for sure. Okay, so that, those are we went over the three best fights on the card already. The main event, the co-main event, and Emmett versus Bektich. Let's go over our post-fight bonuses. I'm pretty sure June is here with the real ones, or I can find them on Twitter machine. But I want to know who you guys would give post-fight bonuses to. Remember, we are giving out 250000 per $10 for these post-fight bonuses because we're not actually giving any money any. We're not actually giving anybody any money at all. Like We're not actually open our wallet whatsoever it's pretend so we can give out five post fight bonuses so five post fight bonuses or two fight of the nights and one post fight bonus or you get the picture i have the official ones here first i'm going to go over mine but before i do that i want to mention to the people that are here live right now i think most of you are regulars this episode of the program i was i'm by myself and you guys are my co-host for the entirety of it next week i've got a co-host lined up who will kind of fill that same spot like the six round post fight show guys have done for me for a long time now. I will have Bill Welker, one half of the MMA on the Rocks podcast next week. And then for UFC 240, I have a very special co-host who will be here for about the first 15 minutes. We'll talk about the main event and co-main event recap reaction with me for that card. That that guest is really going to surprise you. I think it's a, a per, pretty big name in mixed martial arts. You're going to want to look forward to that post-fight show. Hopefully I can uh, keep my wits about me and not seem like a total idiot when I have a kind of a big name in the sport on the show with me. <clears throat> Ivan Pichugin says, fight of the night to uh, Fajera versus Vittori. DC Warriors says, can't lie, Hall versus Elkins was the most intriguing and entertaining fight. Was fascinating uh, watching Hall outstrike him and effectively use his style. Ivan says, uh, Emmett and Uriah for the post-fight bonuses. And fight of the night, Fajera versus Mutanchi. Priyam Alemian says, uh, Jermaine Duranami, Faber, Emmett, Feely, and no fifth entry, sorry for me. All right, no, no fifth entry for me. That is easier, Chris. Thanks. I would give my post fight bonuses to GDR, even though early stoppage, it's not her fault. Uriah Faber, 
Josh Emmett, and Andre Touchy Feely, Jonathan Martinez. The five finishes on the card to get the five post set bonuses for me. I don't think there was a a. I don't think there was a post fight bonus. Oh no, I don't think there was a fight of the night worthy contest deserving my even imaginary post fight bonuses. But the real ones, let's go over the real ones right now, my friends. Ivan, or Chris says that the Martinez had the best knockout of the night. Oh, Triple X, it's not Anthony Smith for UFC 240. It's not a fighter. I'll tell you that. And I can't tell you who it actually is because that person might pull out, might not, might decide to not be my co-host for that show and it might not work out. So I don't want to tell you until like I load up the show and say, and with me for the first time on the post-fight show is this person. The real post-fight bonuses went to Jonathan Martinez for his uh, knee finish in the third fight of the night against Ping Yuan Liu. Liu. Andre Touchy Feely for his right straight to right high kick counter uh, knockout over Shema Marais. Josh Emmett for his jab and then ground and pound finish over Mursad Bektic. And Uriah Faber for his overhand right to the temple finish over the much younger Ricky Simone in the co-main event of the evening. Chris wants to know about how I scored the main event of UFC 239 between Johnny Bones Jones and Tiago Mejeta Santos. I did the live play-by-play. -play. I don't know if you know, I do a live play-by-play -play radio style broadcast for every main card. While I was doing that, and keep in mind, it's hard for me to score fights while I'm calling it out because I'm more thinking about what I'm doing there rather than scoring the fights, but I had it four to one for John Jones. Santos the first round and then the rest of them for John Jones. The closest after the first was the fifth it could have gone to Thiago Santos, but I gave it to John Jones. So the real scores had it 3-2 um, to two in favor of John Jones on two cards and 3-2 to two for Santos on the other one. I just thought that John Jones was controlling the action the majority of the time. Like He, he dictated where the fight took place, uh, and I could see that he was in control of the bout the whole time. Sure, he got clipped a few times, um, and Santos did a really good job with the low, low kicks. I just felt like John Jones did enough to win at least three out of five rounds. You know, he was uh, fainting and making Thiago Santos move back. And at, like th the first round, maybe the first two rounds, John Jones would, would get Santos up t toward the fence and throw a spinning back kick to the body or that stomp to the leg, and then he might miss it and slide past, and then Santos would get off on his um, you know, powerful looping kind of strikes on him. But after a while, I think after the first two rounds, John started to faint quite a bit to draw those big, like, big reactions out of Santos, and then he would like hit him with the the oblique kick to the thigh or the side kick to the thigh or the the side kick to the body or the stepping in elbow type of thing. It just seemed to me like John controlled all of the action. Kyle agrees with me. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Uh, Triple X, I haven't talked to Anthony Smith before, but that might be a really good idea for me to, to search out for him in a future show. Thanks for the idea. Chris, seg significant strikes-wise, it was 1, 2, and 5 for Santos. What are my thoughts on Anthony Pettis versus Nate Diaz? I think ring, I, I don't know. Anthony Pettis looked really good, obviously knocking out Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. He has really good jujitsu, as does Nate Diaz. The the long straight shot punches of Nate Diaz are are solid, um, and we saw him get the better of you know like Michael Johnson with that style of attack. He does a really good job working the body, working upstairs. Um, I think the low kicks of Anthony Pettis, low. Kicking out the lead leg of the Diaz brothers is always a big weapon and it always hinders the forward momentum of the Diaz brothers. I think the kicking game of, of Anthony Pettis, um, the ability to be defensive jiu-jitsu and also his offensive jiu-jitsu game, I think that Anthony Pettis would win that fight, would win that fight for sure.
Also about John Jones versus Tiago Santos, I thought it was weird that John didn't go for takedowns. I mean, he went, he fainted with a couple where he just like kind of reached for the lead leg of Tiago Santos. But I thought if John could have got the fight up against the fence, wrench on his uh, on his power arms a couple of times like he did against Glover Teixeira, go for a takedown and get some ground and pound, he could have looked a lot more impressive. I don't know what was going on with John Jones in that performance, but whatever. I thought he did enough to win, but not enough to be impressive made 2k what's next for carl robertson so in the fight before emmett tkoing mursad bektich carl robertson uh, defeated wellington terman via split decision in the no let's talk about what happened in the fight so robertson and wellington Terman were both kind of firing big shots in tight. Rob, Ro, Robertson landed some big left hands, uh, some decent kicks. When he was on top on ground on the ground, he did quite a bit of damage with ground ground and pound. But Wellington Terman got the better of Carl Robertson in the wrestling department and with his uh, submission game quite a few times. There was a moment where Wellington had Robertson's back and he had it the. the Rear naked choke kind of locked in. He had both hooks in, not the body lock. He didn't have a figure four, but he had both hooks in, uh, the leg hooks in for the rear naked choke position. He had his hands clasped together, had the arm under the chin of Carl Robertson. Robertson went to try to fight the hands of Wellington, couldn't do it, and then just kind of did like a, a wild and crazy explosion where he wiggled back and forth and ended up on top position in the guard of Wellington Terman, which I thought was crazy. Uh, not crazy in the sense of like, why did you do that? But I was just shocked that it worked. That you could just kind of spaz out, roll back and forth, and get out of that what looked like a cinched in rear naked choke position. I I was impressed with Terman's UFC debut. Regardless of the result, he, he won on one of the judges' scorecards. I'm interested to see Wellington Terman compete next. Well, as Chris says, Terman was better on the ground. But Robertson has so much explosive power to get out of positions. Neil says that in the fight before that, Marvin Vittori called out Paolo Borracina Costa, the racer. But wouldn't it make more sense to put Robertson uh, to, and Vittori together next? Both coming off wins, both could use some exposure and experience, and obviously the timing of it's going to work out just fine for them. But what's next for Carl Robertson? Middleweight division. The rankings. Is he even ranked? He's not ranked. Yeah, that'd be fine. Vittori versus Robertson. That, that would just be a heck of a deal. Let's quickly talk about the fight before that. Marvin Vittori defeated Cesar Mutanchi Fajera via unanimous decision 30-27 across the board. Uh, Vittori, the jab cross, was landing pretty much at will on Fajera. I think it was the end of the first round. He got a, he cut him above the nose, and the, the snapping shots from Vittori were making the under eye of Fajera turn red and bleed a little bit. But where I was impressed for Fajera was the takedown defense. It just seemed like kind of hip down hard. But not like a sprawl, just kind of hipped into Fajeda when Fajeda would come in for the takedown attempt. Vittori would get into a 50-50 underhook position with Fajeda, turn him, put him up against the fence, knee him to the thigh. Not a lot of action there, but I was impressed that Vittori could ward off the takedown attempts that easily and then was the stronger, uh, stronger fighter in the clinch, the stronger fighter overall, and I think... History will tell us that we know Marvin Vittori is the more durable fighter than Mutanchi. And Vittori looked pretty good tonight. It wasn't the most exciting fight that we've ever watched, but I liked it, nonetheless. Chris says that Fajeda was not active enough. And Stanley says it was the night of the dog. Wee! Yeah, Chris says Vittori was much stronger physically. Yeah, very, very strong. Sure, let's match him up with Carl Roberson. Eh, doesn't really matter, right? Sounds good to me. Uh, Bayer says, in time I could see Rob Robertson matching up with Krilov or even Shogun. Uh, those guys are at 205 and this fight's at middleweight. But yeah, I mean, I've wanted... 
I've wanted um, Shogun to go to middleweight for a while. Who knows? Ooh. Uh, only other fight. We, we talked about Andre Feely's knockout over Shaman Marais. Obviously, Andre Feely has good lateral movement. Pops a good jab out there. But we didn't mention how good of a night Team Alpha Male had. I mean, Uriah Faber, the leader of it, got that TKO victory. Josh Emmett with the TKO victory. Andre Feely, TKO victory. All three of those in the first round. First fight of the night, Benito Lopez got a decision win for Team Alpha Male. The only loss was the Darren Elkins, unanimous decision to Ryan Hall. And while I'm on the topic of Darren Elkins for a brief second, Rob Amon says that he needs to be cut. He's on a three-fight losing streak. I think the UFC will probably give him one more if he doesn't want to doesn't want to leave. So I don't think they'll cut him. But not great to be on a three-fight losing streak in the UFC. I don't know. It depends on what his contract says. Bayer says, speaking of Team Alpha Male, really curious to see what's coming up for Chan Sung Jung. Fluke versus Brandon Schaub for the strongest weak chin, says Triple X. I don't know. No, I haven't. Uh, Chris asks if Elkins is Team Alpha Male. He definitely is Team Alpha Male. One of the WTFs of the card that we could mention came from Ryan Hall versus Darren Elkins. In between rounds uh, two and three, Chris holds it down Holdsworth in Darren Elkins' corner said, we did a better round that job. But we got to keep going. Or something like that. We Sum it up to, he said, we did a better round that job. Yikes. <laughs> what the F? That's, yeah, I know it was a mix-up of the tongue, but it was funny, nonetheless. And the fight before Ryan Hall versus Darren Elkins, Jonathan Martinez versus Ping Yuan Liu. Jonathan Martinez threw a knee straight up the middle that put... Ping Yuan's lights out. And what is funny about the finish there was I think the fight was probably tied going into the third round. And uh, Brendan Shaw, not Brendan Shaw, Brendan Fitzgerald and Michael Bisbing were on the call tonight. And they were saying, you know, somebody just needs to do something. Go out there and just get after it. Go for go for something. Somebody needs to just, just put a little, a little more effort here. Go for broke or something like that. And Jonathan Martino was like, okay, doke, boop. Just kind of lifted up his knee, caught the chin of Ping Yuan. And got the knockout. And he even said in the post for interview, Michael Bisming was like, were you planning for that? He's like, I've worked on that, that knee quite a bit. And then all I did was kind of lift it up and uh, finished him. Great win. Great win for Jonathan Martinez. I believe that's his first win in the UFC. No, he's got two two in a row now. First finish in the UFC. Um, he came in and lost a decision to Andre Sukumtat. Last time out, he d got a decision win over Luigi Burin. W Luigi Burin. But now... Got to finish over Ping Yuan Liu. Liu. Chris says, the thing is, Elkins had no idea what to do with Hall. His game plan is weird, but it works. Spin till you land or go down and use your freaky BJJ. Well, the, his game is very strange. It's hard for people to deal with. And that is why Uriah, or not Uriah, Ryan Hall is undefeated in the UFC. He's not very active, but he is undefeated in the UFC. He lost his... Uh, professional debut back in 2006 but since he came back to mixed martial arts in 2012 he has gone on a eight win streak are there any other topics that we need to cover on the show i think we did it um now let's go with our shining star of the card we talked about the wtf of the card we gave out our post-fight bonuses. The last thing I want to talk about... Well, I didn't go over Juliana Pena versus Nico Montano. Let's talk about that fight. But while I'm doing that, I wanted to know your guys' shining star of the card. So Juliana Pena versus Nico Montano. It starts out, and they get into the clinch a lot. And Montano looked to get the better of Pena in that position. And Nico Montano looked to be stronger than Juliana Pena early. Pushed her up against the fence... Got the takedown, got the better of Pena on the ground. It looked like Pena had a lot of ring rust. Second round, and just kind of flipped the script. Pena was the better one uh, on the feet. 
as well as in the clinch and on the ground. Pena got the got some uh, takedowns, searched for, I think she went for a Darsh choke at one point, was controlling Montano on the ground. Every time Montano would kind of go for, uh, she would almost get a reversal. Pena would just be able to correct where she was, uh, adjust her position on the canvas, and not allow Montano to, to flip her over. She showed great control. She showed good power. Um, she shook the, the ring rust off. And she didn't know what was next for, re, for, for her either. But even though uh, Juliana Pena has been full of controversy in the past, you know, she kicked that bar, uh, the uh, bouncer at a bar in the testicles because he wouldn't let her in the bar after it was closed. Um, she, she said a lot of really dumb things in the past. I'm excited to watch her next fight, and I'm not sure what is next for Nico Montano. Montano is now uh, four and three in mixed martial arts. In official fights, she's only two. She's one and two in her last three. She's only one and one in the UFC. People were criticizing her even after she won the inaugural women's flyweight champion chip against uh, Roxanne Mataferi. I don't know what's next for her. She had contemplated retirement once. Uh, I don't think she did very well with the criticism of people like saying that she was scared of Valentina Shevchenko. I have no idea what's next for her. Yeah, Triple X, look up that story on, on Pena kicking the guy in the in the junk. Really, really awful. Rob Amon says Montano should be cut. I don't know if she should be, but she might be. She might need to drop back to flyweight, get a couple of wins in in Invicta. But I'm not sure. I don't know what to think about her. Oh, yeah. She, Chris says that Nico would get decimated by Valentina Shevchenko. I agree. Um, Chris says that Faber is the shining star. Made 2K says, I know it's not really a shining star, but the Robertson maybe had it with a re that rear naked choke escape. That was pretty cool. And he just kind of freaked out and got out of it. That was pretty dope. Kyle Mangari, shining stars, Faber. Neil says uh, Faber was the shining star as well. So often to see, so often we see the hometown fighter fall flat. He and Team Alpha Male had a great showing tonight, and the event on an event built to showcase them. Yes, that was. Oh, Rob Amon says give Pena to Holly Holm. Maybe if Holly doesn't retire. Yeah, I I like Uriah Faber as the shining star. But I'm giving my shining star to Josh Emmett. So he was also a hometown guy. I kind of want to be just a different one than you guys are saying, than Faber. And I, it was a fantastic knockout, fantastic performance by him. Coming, I, Didn't he have it? He broke his orbital bone with that elbow. Yeah, yeah, he got knocked out in the second round by Jeremy Stevens at UFC on Fox 28. Uh, he, As a result, he was sidelined for the remainder of 2018 undergo successful surgery to correct facial injuries. I'm pretty sure he broke his orbital bone, uh, some of the bones under his eye. So going into the Michael Johnson fight, the commentators were like, is he going to be hesitant? Is he going to like kind of really be worried about his eye getting broken again against Michael Johnson? He put that away. He came back and knocked out Michael Johnson, and now he gets the first round stop it over Mursad Bektic in his own backyard for Team Alpha Male, of course. And I think the shining star for me goes to Josh Emmett. Chris says that Josh Emmett had a great showing, quite technical as much as powerful. And Crazy White Boy says Team Alpha Male had a had a good night, looked good tonight. Maybe the shining star should just go to Team Alpha Male as a whole. The last question I have for you guys, my co-hosts. First, I want to thank you so much for being here. I really enjoy talking to you guys on these post-fight shows. I hope that you'll enjoy my my guest co-host that I'll have for the next two events. Of course, I mentioned the first one will be Bill Welker, one half of the MMA on the Rocks podcast. He will be there, be here next week with me for UFC on ESPN 4, headlined by Rafael Dos Anjos versus Leon Rocky Edwards. But my last question is what rating would you guys give this night of fights between A and F? I don't want you to tell me in the live chat. If you would please do me the favor of waiting until there's like a normal comment section to come up and then tell me in that comment section what post-fight rating you would give this card 
on a scale of A to F. With A being great, you know, like U.S. Uh, school grading system, A being one of the best fight cards you've ever seen, F being terrible, and I think most of us are going to probably fall in the uh, C area, C plus to C minus area. Anyway, please do that for me, guys. Please give the video a thumbs up. My goal is going to be a hundred thumbs up on this video. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys so much for watching live and for being with me on this post fight show. I'll see you next week for the live play by play for that card UFC on ESPN four, and also be here for the post fight show with my co-host Bill Welker. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next week. Namaste.